chapter 1. Some years back I preached on Matthew's Gospel chapter 1 and beginning with verse 1 and went on to verse 17 and I still remember the disbelief on some of your faces. You're not serious, Pastor. You're not going to go through all those names. Well, it was a, a wonderful time, I remember. But not today. Today we'll start where we all start in Matthew's Gospel chapter 18 and we'll go down to the end of the chapter. Matthew 1, 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, Son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. You know, Christmas is a is an interesting day because very often we put the rest of our lives on hold just so that we can enjoy these 24 hours and then on the 26th or the first or whenever else we all go back to work we pick up our lives again and nothing has changed nothing has changed Nothing changed yesterday when you shipped out at 20, on the 24th and you said, okay, Christmas Day tomorrow, I'm just going to enjoy it, just going to greet people, enjoy the food, say the hellos, wish the Merry Christmases and all of that. Just for one day, I'm going to put everything else on hold and keep it at bay. I don't know whether that's really the intent of Christmas, although very often that's what happens. You probably left office yesterday with unfinished work, which you know will need to get picked up whenever it is that you go back. Christmas doesn't change that. You probably have a relationship that still needs to be worked at, and a day of just celebrating will not fix that either. You probably have fatigue and tiredness and sickness maybe that you had yesterday and today won't change that. And I'm not including the divine providence of God here to do what He wants. What I'm saying is that very often we look at Christmas as a kind of a, an oasis, an utopian day where just everything is perfect for just that time. And we can act and go about everything with a sense of bonhomie and cheer and all of that. And yet there's this thought at the back of our minds that come tomorrow Christmas will be over. The first Christmas and the months leading up to that first Christmas 2,000 odd years ago, I don't think was 
a great celebration. I think for Mary and Joseph, it could have been a very, very trying time. It couldn't have been easy to have had angelic visitations that messed you up, that told you that your fiancé was already carrying a child, and you had nothing to do with it. And then to go through keeping this child, just believing that this child was going to be the son, son of God, the savior of the world, and holding on to that thought for nine whole months. And I wonder whether at any point Joseph was tempted to even wonder whether it would be a boy or a girl. They didn't have our medical advances to, to tell them that what the angel said was indeed what Mary was carrying. He had to wait the whole nine months. I wonder whether there was exceeding great joy when he laid eyes on a son. It couldn't have been a very joyful nine months for them. On this side of the cross, on this side of the New Testament, we're able to celebrate a lot of things that they didn't have the ability, the knowledge to celebrate. In fact, the things that they went through just brought me up short because as I began to focus on Joseph and Mary and think about all that they went through in those nine months, I said, wow, they had to have had something carry them all through that time. They had to be just ones who held on to their faith and who trusted God. Because otherwise, none of this would have made sense. Think about what was at stake. Honor. Honor. In fact, Matthew says, Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly when he found that she was to be with child by the Holy Spirit. He wanted to send her away secretly. There was honor at stake. He, he wanted to not make a public spectacle. He was such a remarkable person. When the correct thing to do, or what would have been expected in that community, was to have publicly shown her for what she was, or what people would think she was. But he held on to being honorable, even in the midst of these situations. And then there was the quote-unquote shame that must be associated with carrying a baby when you're not yet married. And if that wasn't enough, I wonder how often they shared with people and said, this baby that I'm carrying is of the Holy Ghost. And how that was met by the people. Whether there was ridicule and scorn and people laughed at Mary as she was, That's, she's supposed to be carrying the child, son of God. Are they married? No, they're not. His baby? No, it's, I hear it's not his baby. Did they have to go through that? And how do they manage? Shame that a community can so easily cast on people. So easily. Remember reading in Samuel about Tamar and Amnon? David's children. And yet Amnon wanted to sleep with Tamar and comes into her. And she says, don't do this, brother. Don't do this. For where will I go with my shame? Where can I go with my shame? And then there must have been the inconvenience of messed up plans, isn't it? They must have had a date when they would get married. They must have had plans about when they would have children. And all of those things, what they would do, how they would live, where they would live. And all of a sudden, they are running from Bethlehem, 
going to Egypt, from Egypt going to Nazareth, trusting these dreams and these angelic visitations that came to Joseph in dreams, four of them. I wonder whether there was a temptation to get up in the morning and say, did that really happen? Did that really happen? It must have had strong faith, isn't it? Strong faith to have stuck this out and trusted God through it all. I thought to myself, as I looked at this, that the only thing that can help anybody, and I'm talking of beyond Mary and Joseph now, anybody, you, me, Mary, Joseph, go through all of these situations, is to be able to know that there is a greater purpose in what is going on in their lives. That there's a greater purpose. Because here's the downside, beloved. If we don't believe that there's a greater purpose to some of the things that are byproducts of that purpose, then we will get taken down by the byproducts of that purpose. Because honor and shame and messed up plans and ridicule and scorn can do a number on you and me. And we can let go of those wonderful purposes that God has for us because we concentrate on the consequences or the results or the byproducts that are always associated with something that is godly and divine. And I'm sure that they clung on to that. And that's why I said, a day like Christmas sometimes can get to a point where we just say, just for this day, I'm going to put everything on hold and enjoy this day. And yet I believe that if we look at Joseph and Mary and all that transpired with them, we will see that today must not be a day that we only say, I'm going to get an emotional high, I'm going to savor this day, but tomorrow back to the real world. We ought to believe that today can change the real world if we get our eyes right on what God wants to do in our lives. It cannot just be a momentary high. What was the purpose of all this inconvenience? Joseph, son of David, the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus himself alluded to many reasons beyond just being the savior of the world for why he came. Many reasons. At least nine or ten times he said, I came that. And all of them had to do with purpose. The reason that Mary and Joseph had to go through all of that was to fulfill all of these things that Jesus came to fulfill through his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection. Mark 2.17 says, I came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. John 18.37, I came that I should bear witness unto the truth. John 6.38, I came not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. John 12.46, I came as a light into the world. John 10.10, 10, I came that they may have life and that they may have it in abundance. John 9.39, I came to bring judgment upon this world. Mark 1.38 I came to preach therefore also. John 12.27 And for this I came, I came unto this hour in Gethsemane, embracing the cross. And in Matthew 20.28 20, The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. All of these purposes got fulfilled through the life and ministry of Jesus. But for that baby to be born, there was tremendous inconvenience for Mary 
and Joseph. Here's the thing, beloved. You could be going through difficult situations even today. Situations that are trying. It could be that you've pressed a momentary pause and said, let me just enjoy this day. And I wonder today whether it could be that God is calling out to you and say, look beyond what it is that you're experiencing. Look beyond and see the purpose that I have for your life. Look beyond and hold on because there's a fulfillment that is coming. Don't give in. Don't let your eyes focus on the byproducts of that great and wonderful purpose that God has for your life. And ultimately, beloved, we need to come back to that question of why it is that God placed me on this earth today, in this age. Otherwise, everything else will just be a burden for you to carry. Maybe today you're trying to defend honor. Maybe today you're wondering what to do with shame. Something has happened. Maybe you've been disrespected. And yet part of that is that God is going to touch somebody. And that's a purpose for your life. I wonder today whether we can look beyond the things that are bringing us down and find purpose and meaning. Divine purpose, divine meaning for your life that will allow you this Christmas to walk out of this place saying, you know what? I'm going to enjoy this day. But I know that in the days ahead, God is going to help me because I'm not going to focus on the things that are bringing me down. I'm going to focus on the divine plan that He has for me. Beloved, God hasn't finished with you yet. Don't throw in the towel. God hasn't finished with you. Don't begin to look at the problems you have and say, I'm just going to go through this. Just wait it out. In these last 10 days, we've been in different situations and in one of the situations that we were in was at a home for the aged. And I remember that as we sang, they just enjoyed themselves. For them, it was just a, a momentary period of love and peace and joy. At the end of which, they would go back into their rooms. They would bask on it for some time. But then the reality of the fact that they were in a home for the aged would settle in. But as I spoke to them, I spoke about love and joy and peace and hope. And I, as I came to hope, I said, remember that there is hope. As long as you have breath, there is hope. And I still remember, I'll never forget this. As I said that, one lady, she was an open book. Her eyebrow almost went up half an inch when I said that you still have hope. And she looked at me like, you've got to be kidding me. Are you trying to tell me that I have hope in this situation? I went on to expound on it. And I met another lady who pulled me down. So she didn't speak too loud and she said, would you pray with me? I said, sure, for what? She had a walker. She said, will you pray that I don't need this walker? I said, I certainly will. And she pulled me closer. She said, because nobody will pray for that. Everybody says I've got to live with it. I said, as long as there is hope, as long as there is a God, there is hope. And we will pray. We will pray. Beloved, as long as you have breath, God has a purpose and a plan for each one of us that is still not finished. The moment that plan is done, He will take you home. Not before. 
And I think the lesson for us on this Christmas morning is to still find that plan and purpose that God has for you. To move away from the inconveniences that are around you today. The pain, the suffering, the scorn, the ridicule, all of that are par for the course, beloved, for a child, a son, and a daughter of the Most High God. It's par for the course. Don't fight it. But the thing that gets birthed through us will be divine in its nature. And we must not allow that to get in any way throttled. Michael Card wrote a very beautiful song many years ago, kind of trying to get into the mind of Joseph. And the words of the song go like this, How could it be this baby in my arms, sleeping now so peacefully? The Son of God, the angel said, How could it be? Lord, I know he is not my own, not of my flesh, not of my bone. Still, Father, let this baby be the son of my love. And then he says this, Father, show me where I fit into this plan of yours. Show me where I fit into this plan of yours. Jesus came here to pay the price for sin, to offer it to us, and then to take us back to eternity. The incarnation, the atonement, powerful themes, and yet there were other themes as well. Beloved, there's a plan and a purpose that only you can fulfill. And then there are other subplots, if you may, that God just does through us. And in each of these, we ought to look at Him and say, Lord, how do I fit into this plan of yours? How does my life, insignificant as it may be, how do I fit into this grand scheme of humanity? This six billion odd, seven billion people. Why did you place me here now? What is it that you're trying to fulfill? And I know with all of my heart, beloved, that if we can lift our eyes up to the mountains from whence cometh our help, then we will get a hold of our purpose and our plan. And then the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Today cannot be about a momentary high. Today has got to be about a key moment in our lives when we once again caught a hold of the plan and purpose that God has for each one of us. That will sustain us through this day, tomorrow, into the year 2016 and beyond. Amen? Merry Christmas. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Draw us back, Master. Turn our attention and our gaze away from those things that are minor and seem to be so major because we look directly at them. Help us to look at you. Help us to keep our eyes fixed upon you. That we may draw deeply, Lord, of who we are, why we are here, and what you plan to do through our lives, Master, and continue to do each and every day. Master, may that be the big picture of our lives that we never lose sight of. And Lord, hardships, difficulties, trials that we have that are an offshoot, a consequence, a byproduct, help us to embrace them with a sense of equanimity. Lord, knowing that for your will to be birthed, there are some things that must be required to pay the price. And joyfully, Master, like Mary and Joseph did, we will stir our hearts this morning 
And let this be one of our best Christmases yet, where we take the, the presence and the plan and the purpose of a divine God through this day and into the days ahead. Lord Jesus, as always, it's in your beautiful name that we pray these things. Amen.